more. Let's connect. <laughs> Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Ana Mateo is here to discuss a fun English expression that has to do with clouds and success. Then, Kelly Jean Kelly presents the next part of our series on America's presidents. This week, it's Richard Nixon. But first, the Higher Education Report. Isadora Jukic is a biology and chemistry student at John Carroll University near Cleveland, Ohio. She never thought that one day she would be in a classroom where an English teacher asked her to play a board game in order to learn about climate change. Jukic is taking a biology class called Climate Change, Global Impacts. At the same time, she is taking an English class called Environmental Literature. Her university requires students to take two connected classes that examine the same subject in different ways. They both focus on global climate change, Jukic said. Deborah Rosenthal is the English professor, at first, Jukic said she was uncertain about Rosenthal's board game idea. I was just like, this is interesting. Like, we're going to learn about climate change by playing a board game. Like, how fun is this actually going to be and how much are we actually going to take away from it? Rosenthal thought her students would gain a greater understanding about how their own ideas and experiences affect climate change. After testing the games with some adults, she got permission to buy six copies of a game called Solutions. The goal is to pick cards and then add them to the game board in a way that helps reduce global temperatures. Students do not compete against each other. They work together to choose the best plan of action. The game is different from board games such as Monopoly, where the goal is to win. Rosenthal said she hoped the games would give students a chance to talk about climate change in a new way. During most classes, students read material and then discuss their ideas. But by playing the games, it's a way to be social, to engage in conversation. There has to be a lot of energy around the table. It's very collaborative. And in the game that I chose to play, they really were able to work together and try to come up with a solution so that the planet was not destroyed. During the class, she said, students laughed, disagreed, and had to call for votes as a way to decide how to move forward in the game. Jukic said... It was a way to have fun while also learning about such a serious subject. Both Jukic and Rosenthal said many American high school students do not get a lot of information about climate change. The connected classes at John Carroll permit students to, as Jukic said, take a deeper dive into the science of global climate change. This linked pair really opened my eyes. A comment like that would make Megan Youssef smile. She is a climate educator based in Cleveland. She was one of the people who took part in Rosenthal's test event. Youssef uses a game called Climate Fresk to teach people about the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Climate Fresque is also a French nonprofit organization. Yusuf said the Fresque is a kind of climate card game that helps people get their heads around the problem. The IPCC report is 4,000 pages long. Yusuf's game has 42 cards. She said 
Groups that play the game have a discussion when they place the cards on a long table. If a player has a card called Destruction of the Water Cycle, they might start a discussion about severe storms, such as the one that flooded parts of California in August. The goal of a fresque is not to win, Yusuf said. The idea is for players to learn about climate change and feel energized to help their communities. It's very powerful for people to come together and acknowledge that other people care about this problem, too, she said. Yusuf said the Fresque game started in France, and one million people have played it. She said she knows people like her in Australia, India, China, Thailand, and many European nations have worked to bring the game to students. They have brought it to health events and financial groups. Rosenthal said some of the games she looked at would be good for students who are already good at English. One, called Carbonique, is made for French speakers, so her students would need to use a translation program to turn the words into English. The games are global, Jukic said. That is because she and her classmates said they were able to see how one player's decision about agriculture affected another player on the other side of the world. She said the games showed her that in the game of climate change and the climate crisis, no individual wins. It's either we all suffer from this or we all somehow collaborate to work our way out of this and and turn the clock back on climate change. In Jukic's opinion, that is a good lesson for any student to learn. I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Today, we talk about being in a good place. And we begin with an old American pop singer. When Karen Carpenter sings about being on top of the world, she describes feeling happy, thankful, and being in a great place. If you are on top of the world, you are in a great position. You are happy with life. When things are really going your way, you can also say, You are sitting pretty. Sitting pretty means you are in a very favorable situation. You love your job, you have a nice home, and your finances are in good order. This expression can also mean you are in a good, safe, and secure position. You don't need to worry about the future. It can also mean you are in an advantageous position. For example, when a friend of mine bought property, she found herself in a price war with another buyer. However, she was sitting pretty for several reasons. She offered a big down payment and a flexible move-in date. This example shows how sitting pretty can have a little difference in meaning than other similar expressions. It can suggest that you are in a good situation, especially when others are not. As we said, we have other expressions that mean about the same thing as being on top of the world and sitting pretty. If you are in a great situation, and have a favorable position, you can also say you have it made. You are ahead of the game. You are going places. If you feel great about your life, and just feel great in general, you might say you are on cloud nine. The origin of this cloud expression comes from the field of agriculture. The Farmer's Almanac explains that scientists wanted to make recording cloud observations easier. So they rated clouds 0 to 9. 
zero represented the lowest clouds, and nine the highest clouds. Word experts say this is where the expression "to be on cloud nine" probably comes from. If you are on cloud nine, you'll be very high up, which may also describe your feelings. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. When it comes to your English studies, we hope all of you are on cloud nine. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo discuss being in a good place. She joins us now. Welcome to the show, Ana. Hello again, Dan. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's remind our listeners about one phrase you discussed. That's sitting pretty. What does that one mean, Dan? When you are in a great position or on top of the world, you are sitting pretty. That means you are in a favorable situation. Everything is good. Everything is going your way. You also talked about. Clouds this week, and I loved the story behind that one. The expression is being on cloud nine. Now that is a little bit different than being ahead of the game, and it comes from the world of agriculture. Scientists would actually rate clouds from lowest to highest, and the highest clouds were nine. So if you're on cloud nine, you are feeling pretty good. Anna, I'm on cloud nine. Just thinking about that story, it's、uh, it's always great to talk with you, and I bet our listeners would agree that words and their stories puts them ahead of the game when it comes to learning English. And your podcast, Dan. Don't forget. <laughs> Thanks for talking with us, Anna. You're welcome, Dan. Have a great day. Bye. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Richard Nixon. Nixon is well known to many Americans for one reason: he was the only president to resign from the position. Facing possible legal action by Congress, Nixon left office early in his second term. Yet Nixon's early political career was marked by success. He also had some noteworthy achievements during his White House years, and he attained his goal of moving the government in a more conservative direction. In his later years, Nixon and his supporters tried to reclaim his place as an expert on international affairs. But for many Americans, the name Nixon remains linked to distrust of national leaders, abuse of power, and political wrongdoing. Richard Nixon had a difficult early life. He was the second of five sons in a Quaker family. His parents owned a lemon ranch in California, near the city of Los Angeles. But the family struggled financially, and two of Richard's brothers died, one as a small child, and one as a young adult. In time, his parents' business failed. And the Nixons moved to a nearby town. The parents and children all worked at a filling station that sold fuel and other products. Despite the many hours he worked at the store, Richard Nixon was a top student in high school. He was offered financial aid to attend Harvard University, 
but the family needed even more money to send him there. Instead, he attended a local college, where he became the student body president, joined a debate team, acted in the theater, and played football. Nixon went on to law school at Duke University in North Carolina. Even with his impressive background, he did not get the jobs he sought at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, or top law offices. So he returned to the California town where he grew up and began working as a lawyer. There, he married another actor at the community theater. Her name was Thelma Ryan, but she was called Pat. The Nixons went on to have two daughters, Trisha and Julie. In 1942, Nixon accepted a job with the federal government in Washington, D.C. He did not stay in the position long. After the United States entered World War II, Nixon joined the Navy. He served as an officer in the Pacific. When he returned to the U.S., Republican Party officials asked him to be a candidate for Congress. Nixon agreed. He won two terms in the House of Representatives, and then a seat in the U.S. Senate. Two years later, Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican presidential candidate, asked Nixon to be his vice president. The two men won in an electoral landslide, and in 1953, Nixon took office as vice president. He was only 40 years old, the second youngest vice president in U.S. history. Nixon's early political career is remembered for several reasons. One is how quickly he rose to high government office. Another is for his part in the Alger Hiss case in the late 1940s. Hiss was a top official in the State Department. He was accused of being a communist in the 1930s and 1940s, and of passing information about the U.S. government to Soviet spies. Hiss denied the accusations. The case was big news in the United States. It showed the clash between people who believed Hiss was falsely accused as a way to discredit liberal policies and people who believed the government was protecting communist sympathizers. Nixon was in the second group. He was part of the investigation against Hiss and pushed for his indictment. Nixon's efforts succeeded, and Hiss went to jail for almost four years. Later, Nixon said that the case was one of the reasons for his rise to power. Nixon also earned national attention with an event that has become known as the Checkers Speech. It happened in 1952, when Nixon was running for vice president. Some reporters accused Nixon of corruption. They said he was accepting money and gifts from wealthy donors in exchange for his political support. Nixon went on television to deny the claims personally. At the time, Americans were not used to seeing politicians speaking directly to the public. Yet Nixon spoke informally and emotionally from what appeared to be a home. He explained his family's finances. He said he did not accept campaign donations for personal benefit. But, he added, there was one exception. A supporter had once given the Nixon children a black-and-white dog they called Checkers. Nixon said he refused to return his daughter's pet. The public and Republican Party officials loved the speech. Nixon appeared warm and likable. Middle-class Americans especially said they could relate to him. Most forgot the claims against him, 
and Nixon's political career was saved. During the following eight years, he served as vice president in the Eisenhower administration. But then, Nixon's luck turned. In 1960, Nixon lost as a presidential candidate to John F. Kennedy. He blamed, in part, the media. Then, in 1962, he lost his efforts to be governor of California. Nixon said he was retiring from politics. He famously told reporters, You won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Yet, seven years later, he was in the White House. It was one of the most memorable comebacks in U.S. political history. When Nixon took office in 1969, some Americans thought the country was in crisis. The economy was not doing well. Race riots had been erupting in big cities. Many people were still trying to recover from the violence of a year earlier. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. and President John F. Kennedy's brother Robert had both been shot and killed. Pollution of the environment was becoming a major political issue, women were pressing for equal rights, and many Americans continued to protest American involvement in Vietnam. Nixon took action. During his first years in office, he supported reforms and rules to improve the economy, protect the environment, increase workplace and other opportunities for women, support civil rights, and, in his words, bring peace with honor in Vietnam. But for the most part, Nixon did not have the support of Congress to enact legislation. So he expanded the power of the presidency to carry out his goals. He is remembered especially for three foreign policy moves. In 1972, he visited China, with which the U.S. government had tense relations since the Chinese Communist Party took power. As the Alger Hiss case showed, Nixon was strongly anti-communist, but he made establishing diplomatic relations between the two sides possible again. He also visited the Soviet Union and was the first U.S. president to visit Moscow. Nixon and the Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, agreed to limit the growth of nuclear arms. Their actions helped ease tensions at a time when U.S. officials were worried about the expansion of communism. And Nixon did succeed in reaching a peace agreement with North Vietnamese leaders. In 1973, American troops slowly began to leave the country although fighting there continued. Nixon's foreign policy achievements helped him in the 1972 election campaign. His first presidential election had been extremely close. The second he won by one of the widest electoral vote margins in U.S. history. Even though he was popular with voters, Nixon had been concerned about his political future. Nixon was so worried that, before the election, he created a secret team to prevent any damaging information from reaching the media. Later, its job expanded to include investigating any information that might hurt his public image. About five months before Election Day, five men broke into the opposition party's headquarters at the Watergate, 
a hotel and office complex in Washington, D.C. The team had already stolen copies of secret campaign documents. Now, in the middle of the night, the men were trying to add listening equipment to the telephones. In other words, spy on the opposition. But a security guard became suspicious and called the police. The men were caught and arrested. When the story came to light, Nixon publicly denied that any White House officials were involved in the crime. But in time, the public learned that Nixon was lying. In fact, he assisted with payments to the men who were arrested. And he tried to use the Central Intelligence Agency to block an FBI investigation of the crime. Nixon knew that the Watergate break-in was only part of the illegal or questionable acts he could be held responsible for. Later, people connected with Nixon told investigators that the president had taped everything that happened in his office. Investigators demanded the tapes. They would prove how much Nixon knew about the illegal operations. The president refused. He dismissed the lead investigator. Two other Justice Department officials resigned in protest. A new investigator was appointed, and the U.S. Supreme Court ordered Nixon to release the tapes. At the same time, the House of Representatives voted to remove Nixon from office. They charged him with obstructing justice, abusing his power, covering up a crime, and violating the Constitution. Finally, Nixon released the tapes. But before the Senate could hold a trial, in which the president would almost certainly be found guilty, Richard Nixon resigned. He left the White House the following day. Nixon lived for 20 more years. He wrote a number of books, traveled, spent time with his family, and offered foreign policy advice to other leaders. He continued to deny that he had done anything criminal as president. Instead, Nixon said he had made bad decisions. And he did not go to trial. The next president, Gerald Ford, used his power to pardon Nixon for all offenses against the United States. But Nixon's image was permanently damaged. Most people found evidence in the tapes that Nixon knew about a related series of crimes commonly known as Watergate. They also found that some of his public statements were dishonest. They said he made them to forward his own political goals, not to further the public good. As a result, Nixon's place in U.S. history is generally thought to be a troubled one. To be sure, he made a number of positive accomplishments, both within the U.S. and internationally. But his presidency left the country shaken. When Ford replaced him as president, he said to Americans, Our long national nightmare is over. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English podcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. 
And I'm Dan Friedel.